Choir, it's really good to have you back. I feel like I got my right wing and my left wing. <laughs> but all is right with the world, amen? <laughs> you know, some days you've just got to know what people are saying about you. I love that even Jesus asks his disciples, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? And that reminds me of the message in this poem from Billy Collins titled, appropriately, Some Days. As you know, Billy puts you in sort of a place, so imagine with me as the words are read. Some days I put the people in their places at the table, bend their legs at the knees if they come with that feature, and fix them into the tiny wooden chairs. All afternoon they face one another, the man in the brown suit, the woman in the blue dress, perfectly motionless, perfectly behaved. But other days, I am the one who is lifted up by the ribs, then lowered into the dining room of a dollhouse to sit with the others at the long table. Very funny, but how would you like it if you never knew from one day to the next if you are going to spend it striding around like a vivid god, your shoulders in the clouds, or sitting down there amidst the wallpaper, staring straight ahead with your little plastic face? Bedrock or stumbling block? Striding around like a vivid god or sitting down there amidst the wallpaper. Day by day, our roles change. Action by action, we interact on a variety of levels with others. And like each one of us, depending on whose point of view you're reading, Jesus is also revealed in a variety of ways. He's a healer, a storyteller, a blasphemer, a mystic, a critic, a sage, a nuisance, a comforter, an aggravator, a teacher, even a drunkard. Perspective is everything isn't it? And often we see exactly what we're looking for. So when Jesus asks his question, who do you say that I am, knowing that there are all those perspectives out there, then we hear maybe from a slightly different understanding Peter's words. You are the Christ. Four words that move Jesus from myth to savior, from abstract to real. Now Mark, in his usual succinct writing style, stops right there. That's all we hear about that dialogue. So I really appreciate Matthew's embellishment of the story because in Matthew's version we read, then Jesus replied, Happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human has shown this to you. Rather, my Father, who is in heaven, has shown you. And I tell you that you are Peter, and I'll build my church on this rock, and the gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven, and anything you loosen on earth will be loose, loosened in heaven. So in those words, Jesus' response to Peter's declaration, you are the Christ, we discover that Peter is the bedrock, foundational to the emerging church, a role that I am sure that he finds infinitely rewarding and definitely preferable to the role that comes next. And then we read from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, 
and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble. For you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Wow. From bedrock to stumbling stone, all in one little passage of Scripture. How does that happen? Well, to understand that, let's go back. Jesus' disciples are undergoing a pretty intense apprenticeship with Jesus. And it's about to get far more intense as he begins his journey to Jerusalem. And before embarking on his journey south, Jesus sort of pauses to check in with his disciples near the northern city of Caesarea Philippi. So the first thing he asks them is, who do people say that I am? Well, now that's a relatively easy question, right? I mean, the disciples simply report on the buzz that they've heard among the crowds. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So Jesus' ministry of preaching and teaching and healing has indeed borne resemblance to that of the mighty prophets of Israel. And their response is really, they're not far off the mark. Jesus is a lot like that, but they don't quite get to the heart of the matter. So then Jesus asks his disciples a more pointed question. And you, who do you say that I am? Well, Peter, who's often the first one to speak, responds, you are the Christ. And of course, we who know the whole story knows that Peter has given the right answer. And yet the answer that Peter has given really is not very logical. The title Christ in Greek or Messiah in Hebrew was associated in Jewish tradition with an anointed king a royal figure from the line of David expected to come and to free Israel from their Gentile oppressors, purify the people, and restore Israel's independence and glory. And absolutely nothing in Jesus' career up to now has given any indications of claims to royalty or political ambitions. So far, Jesus has made no claims to be Messiah, and he has certainly shown no sign of taking on the Romans. So you wonder how on earth it was that Peter came up with those four little words. Perhaps Peter hopes that when they go to Jerusalem, Jesus will take on this messianic role. Or perhaps that's why Jesus tells his disciples to tell no one about him because he knows that they're still really far away from understanding what he is all about. So as soon as Jesus begins to speak of what is to come in his role as Messiah, rejection, suffering, death, Peter is really quick to try to set him straight. And so he takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. And we can sort of imagine Peter saying, no, 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 Jesus. This is not the way that it's supposed to go. The Messiah is supposed to conquer the Romans, not get killed by them. What good, Jesus, is a dead Messiah? Now, Peter's response is really understandable in light of the messianic expectation of the Jews which are perhaps not so very different from what we want in a savior. We want someone who's strong and powerful, someone who will rescue us from all of our troubles and defeat our enemies. And too often in popular evangelism, Jesus is presented in this way, sort of a a superhero who solves every problem for us, a a guarantor of prosperity and success. 
But nothing could be further from what Jesus has in mind. So Jesus' response to Peter comes across as pretty harsh. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble. For you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. I find that intriguing that he says that actually Peter is a stone that could make him stumble. This is something that could get in the way of Jesus' ministry, could stop what he is trying to do. And I think that then this is one of those moments in Scripture that really highlights the vast distance between us and the way that we think and God and the way that God thinks. Though Jesus is God with us, we cannot tame him or make him over into our image. Most of us, if we're honest, we'd like a savior who's a winner and one who makes us winners. But instead, Jesus consistently insists on identifying with the lowliest of losers. He will allow himself to be judged and condemned as a blasphemer by Jewish religious leaders. He will allow himself to be mocked and tortured and executed as a criminal by the Romans. And that's not all. Jesus actually expects his disciples to follow him on this path of suffering and death. Anyone really excited about that? He says, if any want to become my followers, let them say no to themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. So here, maybe it's really important for us to be clear about what Jesus means by taking up the cross. He's not talking about the suffering that's just part of living in a broken world. Everything from annoying neighbors to serious illness to natural disasters. Neither is he telling us to seek out suffering or martyrdom. Amen. Because Jesus himself didn't seek it, though he was willing um, to go through with it as he foresaw that that was going to be the inevitable outcome of his mission. No, Jesus speaks of losing our lives for his sake and for the sake of the gospel. Taking up our cross means being willing to suffer the consequences of following Jesus faithfully, whatever those consequences might be. It means putting Jesus' priorities and purposes ahead of our own comfort, our own preferences, even our own security. It means being willing to lose our lives by spending them for others, using our time, our resources, our gifts, even our energy, so that others might experience God's love made known in Jesus Christ. How do we do that? How do we possibly do that in the crazy world in which we find ourselves. I think that our instinct for self-preservation fights it at every step. We're too busy. We don't get it. We don't understand it. Oh, we're not really needed. All of those little voices that run through our heads. And in that sense, we're no different from those first disciples. They certainly tried to save their lives, though Jesus outlined it pretty plainly and tried to prepare them for what was going to come in Jerusalem, every single one of them deserted him. And Peter, that star student who had the right answer, the bedrock of the church, he not only ran away, he denied three times that he even knew the man named Jesus. Now we might wish that things had happened differently, that Jesus had followed a more dignified, Messiah-like path, and that the disciples had been more heroic. 
But that's not the story that we have in front of us. What we have before us is a story about a Messiah being tortured and killed by the powerful and abandoned by his closest companions. And friends, we live in very much the same kind of a world today. We live in a non-Christian world where the words, you are the Christ, are not the norm. And there really are no responses satisfying to non-Christians to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? that begin with, well, my church says, or my denomination says, or even my pastor says, but only the question, what do you say? So I pray today that you feel empowered to step forward and to speak for yourselves not to defer your answer to another source, even if that source is the most awesome source out there with the best of intentions. Not to deflect your personal response with a well-rehearsed assertion from a respectable representative. Not to quote anyone else's words, but to spend time listening to Jesus' question to you. As we take communion later today, I invite you to dedicate this communion to that question, to spending it as a time to listen and believe in Jesus' promise to Peter, on you I will build my church. That wasn't a reward. That was a need. Not a blessedness for a job well done, but being a blessing to and for others. And that job has been passed on to us. And according to Jesus, the church is not the church when it is silent. When people's lives are at stake, cautious silence or not having an answer to that question about the very core of who we are as a church. It's just not an option. People's lives are at stake right now. They need to know the answer that you have to the question, who do you say that I am? Bedrock? or stumbling block. That decision is yours.